Interesting. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I have a conflict of interest, but owning an aspirin factory is not one of them. So in my talk, it will come across as I'm a real aspirin uh, advocate that I am. Let me share some facts with you. DVT prophylaxis after total joint arthroplasty. First of all, there is no absolute prophylaxis. There is not a single prophylaxis that will prevent all VTEs. And if you are a high-volume surgeon, you will, in your lifetime, probably lose a patient to pulmonary embolus at some point, regardless of what VTE prophylaxis you use. The question of what is the best prophylaxis, as you know, there's a whole menu of these prophylactic agents. It depends on what you're trying to prevent. If you're trying to prevent asymptomatic DVTs, your goal and the type of agent you would use is very different than if you were trying to prevent fatal pulmonary embolus. But I think it's fair to say that most of us in this room are concerned about fatal pulmonary embolus and probably don't care too much about asymptomatic distal DVTs because they are very common. And in our mission to try to prevent DVT or VTE, we need to be very careful so that we do not cause further problems. As this young girl says, dear captain, my name is Nicola. I'm eight years old. This is my first flight, but I'm not scared. I like to watch the class go by. My mom says the crew is nice. I think your plane is good. Thanks for a nice flight but don't fuck up the landing. And I think that's probably true in your uh, situation because if you look at the aggressive agents we use in uh, VTE preven prevention, we can actually paradoxically cause more death. So the more potent agent you use, the more likely you are to actually kill your patient as a result of something else than VTE. And that's been shown multiple studies, but I think the most landmark study was the one by Nigel Sharrock that showed mortality was higher when they used potent anticoagulation. And there has been multiple other studies since then, but time doesn't allow me to go into every one of them. The other fact you need to know is that despite administration of toxic drugs, we really haven't changed the incidence of fatal pulmonary embolus. In fact, if you look at the incidence of fatal PE over the last 10, 15, 20, 30 years, it remains exactly constant. I have a reason as to why I think that's the case, but don't be fooled to think that by switching to a potent anticoagulation, you're going to make a difference to the incidence of fatal PE, because you won't. So why do we still continue to administer aggressive anticoagulation? First is the issue related to legal. Uh, in Philadelphia, where I practice, there are more lawyers than human beings, and there is uh, obviously a lot of these issues that we have to face. And um, th this used to be very common, but now the lawyers have moved away from VTE and they've moved towards infection. Now, infection happens to be the number one legal issue in the United States after orthopedics procedures. The second reason for people continuing to use anticoagulation is so-called guidelines. This was the SKIP guidelines, a governmental agency, but look to see who actually sponsored that particular guideline to publish that sort of recommendation. So be very careful about what you read. And then there's, of course, the CHESS guidelines that goes all the way back to 1985. CHESS guideline used to be written by guys that had interest. And again, I, I am myself a guy that works with industry. I have no issues with it. Uh, being a consultant in industry, but I think if you are a consultant in industry, being paid to write guidelines, that's a very different thing than if you work with industry. So here, all the guys that were writing the guidelines were actually being sponsored by companies that produce low molecular weight heparin, fund the Pyronox, Factor 10, etc. And then there's the dirty politics. And Robert Barrick has given a beautiful one-hour talk that was picked up by Washington Post, actually, and it's been all over the uh, YouTube at some point. And I, time doesn't allow me to go into it, but there is an absolutely very deep-seated political issue, both in the United Kingdom and in the United States, that rides and unfortunately drives the issue with regard to selection of anticoagulation. This particular gentleman was a congressman. To cut a long story short, he brought in the, uh, the Part D Medicare that cost billions of dollars for the American uh, health care at the moment. He then resigned and he was on an actually $18 million salary from the pharmaceutical companies for a long period of time and continued to enjoy that high salary for a long time. Department of Justice in the United States and in the United Kingdom have issued multiple, multiple warnings for the companies that have continues to 
continue to um, uh, advertise their uh, medications out of indications. This was a warning to Aventus from the Department of Justice. There has been healthcare surgical uh, committee. These two gentlemen are directly paid by pharmaceutical companies in the United Kingdom, and they have very close link to uh, NICE guidelines for a long time. And I've written to NICE guidelines for the past 10 years, and I will tell you what NICE guidelines uh, have said in recent years. So what do you do with all this information? First of all, I will tell you that don't read a paper that looks at distal DVT, diagnosed at two weeks, and whether your drug made a difference to it or not. That's, uh, that's not relevant to your clinical practice, and you don't want to be looking at drugs to do that. And, and if you are actually a believer in mechanical propagation, think again, because the thought that distal DVT travels up the veins and goes to the lungs is actually probably not true, at least not in the acute phase. And DVT does not act as a proxy for pulmonary embolus. They can both occur as a part of a hypercoagulable state. We know they can happen. DVT can happen with PE, or they can happen separately. And the incidence of uh, VTE varies depending on what you use in your hospital to diagnose it. So look at this graph, and I looked at this. This was, when we were using VQ scan, the incidence of pulmonary embolus was much lower than when you use multi-detective CT, because multi-detective CT will pick up every little embolus in the periphery of the lung, which actually may not be a pulmonary embolus. That may be a fat emboli traveling from the intramedullary canal. So if you're using multi-detector PE, the patients that have a slightly hypoxic in the post-operative period, you're going to have a lot of pulmonary emboli, and they actually are not pulmonary emboli. So this particular paper we wrote, it's very, it looks complicated, it's very simple. If you haven't seen it, I would, I would really urge you strongly to look at this paper and make this graph your hypoxia protocol in your hospital. Don't send every single patient with oxygenation of 88% down to the uh, multi-detective CT because you're going, to die, you're going to see a pulmonary embolus. So this talks about administration of oxygen and selective workup. We've had it for the past 20 years. It's made no difference to the incidence of pulmonary embolus at our institution, but it has reduced the incidence of pulmonary embolus diagnosed at my institution by 80%. The other fact is that there's emphasis on pharma pharmaceuticals, and as you know, it underrates the risk of bleeding and other adverse outcomes. All the uh, anticoagulation, they're potent. It can cause bleeding, hematoma formation, infection, increases all-time mortality. Scenarios like these are not uncommon, and unfortunately, when they happen, you, as the surgeon, is going to have to probably wake up in the middle of the night and take these patients to the operating room and then deal with the consequences of a disaster like this that is going to continue for a long period of time. And unfortunately, your patients are going to continue to pay a price. Here's a patient that was placed, when went to rehab and was placed on factor 10 inhibitor. I use aspirin in my, all my patients, and unfortunately, as you can see, disastrous consequences. Then remember, older data is old, modern approaches is required, aspirin is emerging as the overall winner. Here's the American Association of Hip and Knee Surgeons survey. When we started using aspirin, only 12% of hip and knee surgeons in America were using aspirin, and that number is now 88%. And this year will be another survey. I guarantee you it will be over 90% of surgeons are going to use aspirin in America. Imagine the difference that has made to the patients in the U.S. The number of hematoma formations, the number of bleedings, the persistent drainages, the infections, everything else we've saved, on top of the cost that you have saved for the United States healthcare. So please consider it strongly. And in closing, I'll tell you, if you're a believer that there are no guidelines supporting use of aspirin, think again. CHESS guidelines actually give aspirin a 1B, which is the highest recommendation that exists for hip, knee, and, and total hip after fractures. Academy has always endorsed aspirin as a great potent uh, um, agent. This is the Scottish uh, uh, guidelines. It endorses aspirin. And at last, the NICE guidelines came out in the United Kingdom endorsing aspirin for total knee. I'll continue to battle with them until they endorse it for total hip as well in the future. Aspirin is accepted by many guidelines. There's plenty of evidence to support its efficacy. PEP trial from New Zealand is probably one of the best and the biggest series that exists out there. We've written papers. Many other investigators in the United Kingdom, uh, United States and other places have written it. Don't be fooled by your hematologist telling you that aspirin only works on the arterial side and not on the venous side. You remember the Verkov's triad and tell them to pick up one journal. That's the November issue of New England Journal of Medicine that has multiple papers 
old randomized prospective study that shows aspirin is a very effective agent on the venous side. So what else aspirin does? It reduces fever, reduces heart attacks, reduces MI, reduces strokes, reduces wound drainage, reduces readmission, reduces periprosthetic joint infection, and of course it reduces cost. Is it good for all? No. You need to individualize it. There are patients, and this is the reason why we haven't made a difference to the uh, incidence of fatal pulmonary embolus, because there's a genetic predisposition that we have continued to ignore. If you identify those patients who are at genetic risk for VTE and give them the potent anticoagulation, we may make a difference to the incidence of fatal PE. So what do we do? We give 81 milligram to our low disc for four weeks, starting on the day of surgery. High-risk patients are seen by internists, and they are put on more potent and uh, aggressive anticoagulation. And I do administer that to about 10% of my patients. And I use this app to determine who is or is not at high risk. Thank you very much for your time.